And thanks for your patience. Good afternoon. I'm Stephen Richardson. I want to thank everybody for their patience. Uh, our seminar speaker this afternoon is Patrick Folks from the Army Research Laboratory. Dr. Folks obtained his PhD from Columbia in 1981. He was a member of the technical staff at Bell Labs from 1981 to 1987, and he's been at the Army Research Lab since 1987. His research, research interests involve uh, optoelectronic studies on semiconductor materials. And very recently, he and his colleagues have been interested in topological materials and topologically enabled devices. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Folks. Patrick, it's on you. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for waiting so long patiently for this talk. I I must confess I'm not very familiar with Zoom, and so that probably created all the problems. But anyway, it's one of those things. Okay, so the title of my talk is I'm going to be talking about topological phase transitions in thin layers of alpha tin. And on screen one, you can see it's a collaboration between a bunch of folks, uh, no pun intended, but um, half of us are from ARL, and the other half is from UCSP primarily. Okay, so now this talk, um, Early in the spring, we, we intended to give a talk that, that uh, involves a fair amount of experimental work and theoretical work. But of course, after COVID um, interrupted, all labs, all labs were shut down, including also UCSB's lab was shut down. So we didn't make much progress on the experimental side. However, um, our theorist, George Costa, made a lot of significant progress. And so most of the talk actually will involve um, work that, theoretical work that George Acosta did, if not all of it actually. Okay. And to just to make um, things clearer, I listed the collaborators on the, on this slide. Um, you can see George Acosta does theory and the others, um, the kind of work that they did, experimental work primarily is shown. Uh, in addition, Patrick Taylor, who is primarily an MB grower at ARL and at UCSB, we have an MB grower, Alex, Chan and um, Sean Harrington. We did a lot of the work and some work in that era also. In the next slide, we show um, some background material on alpha tin. This is a diamond allotrope of um, tin material. It's a, typically it, um, it grows naturally below 13 degrees centigrade in bulk. However, um, in 1987, um, MB growth of alpha tin was achieved and this allowed stable films to be formed at around, um, up to around um, 100 degrees C, if it's grown on cattail or indium and timonite substrates. Okay, just to give some background, this material is particularly interesting for topological materials because um, it has uh, accidental crossing of the conduction of valence band. And this was discovered primarily years ago, back in the 19, around 1970. And uh, a bunch of theoretical work, was, theoretical work was done on this, but nobody emphasized the topological aspects in those days because of um, it was just not realized at the time. So the key thing about this band structure is that it has, it's a zero back, alpha tin is a zero band gap semiconductor due to strong relativistic corrections and um, spin orbit coupling. It has a band gap, which is quite unique in that it has a Fermi level, which is, um, let me go back, sorry. A Fermi level, which is um, pinned at the, at the, at the bottom. The gamma eight, gamma seven band gap points along in the in the um, at the gamma point, and um, it's already you can see it has all the characteristics of a topological insulator if you can split this this um, degeneracy point here, and so with strain, you can achieve that as will be discussed um, in the rest of the talk. So basically, it has that interesting characteristic in that it has a degeneracy of the conduction, the gamma eight conduction valence band and the possibility of getting an inverted band structure with the gamma seven band being below, which is typically the electron band being below the valence band. Okay, in uh, around 2007, um, it was shown by Fu and Kane that this material is a strong topological insulator. If it's strained, unaxially strained, um, compressive strain, unaxially, oh, sorry, tensile strain, um, along the Z direction, the growth direction, you can open up a band gap and it becomes a, a strong top of the insulator. 
so this work was um, also shown that basically if this can be achieved, usually the uh, material is grown on the compressive in-plane strain, which, which um, due to the difference in, in the lattice constants of um, alpha tin and the substrates, cat tail and indium timonide. And um, this creates an interesting experimental situation so that we can um, explore the topological phase changes in this material. Around 2017, the details are also shown by um, these, these authors that you can have achieve a compressive strain or a tensile strain basically by, by switching the um, lattice, by switching the subject material if you, if you can find one. And so it gets an interesting situation, which is shown schematically in this, in this picture here, the band gap picture shows that under compressive strain, you open up a band gap, but under tensile strain, you can actually have a band crossing and you can have degenerate crossings at two points along the z-axis, which makes it a, a direct semi-metal. So it is possible then to achieve topological phase changes by if you can vary the, the strain in the material or, to, or by this technique using the, uh, lattice strain from the substrate to go from topological forms to compressive to tensile strain. The direct semi-metals are topological materials that have symmetry protected band degeneracies. So they are certainly an interesting topological material. Because of um, band gap anisotropies, it's also quite interesting because you can achieve velocity is uh, strain dependent and the direct cones are slightly tilted. That's some details that are interesting. Okay, now over the recent years, uh, it's shown become puzzling because um, people were able to achieve a variety of um, topological material phases, going from 3D TI to direct semi metal as the thickness is varied a thickness of grown layers of alpha tin is varied. And so this was somewhat confounding. I would go into all the details, but a variety, take from the slide, you can see that a variety of phases were observed using, depending upon the orientation, as well as the, the thickness of the um, thick materials. And this was quite puzzling. Um, you can go from a 3D TI material, at, you know, and, and people observe direct semi metal materials as they go to thinner layers. Materials are grown on both cat tail substrates, but in these slides, we're showing only indium timonite substrates for a reason, because people don't usually use um, RPS measurements to, to observe topological materials when you have um, cat tail substrates. And because substrates are not as high quality as indium timonite, that becomes an experimental problem. So in our group at ARL, we became interested in trying to use alpha tin as an electronic material, but we were curious, we were puzzled by the fact that we see these various confusing arguments a 3D TI or a direct summer metal, depending upon the orientation, the thickness, and so on. So early around uh, 2000, and about three or four years ago, we started work in this material to understand why we see these phase changes in alpha tin. So this work was started about, like I said, about three or four years ago. George Dacosta is, is a, theor is a uh, condensed matter theorist in our group. And um, his work showed that in alpha tin, thin films, you can get, you know, basically you can get um, the thickness and quantum confinement plays a strong role. This was not previously realized. And by using quantum confinement effects, you can actually go from being a direct semi metal at thick layers of alpha tin to uh, a direct a 3D topological insulator as you go to thinner layers. And there's a critical point at which these effects become critical, but, and so on. And uh, as we will point it out in the following slides. And this slide just shows basically um, the typical um, valence band structure, I mean, uh, uh, band structure material uh, as you go from um, the rack semi metal to a topological top insulator. In one case, you can see that there's a topological Dirac cones are formed, and um, you can see a Dirac crossing at a Dirac point. And uh, this is usually the case where you have the rack semi metal, where when the band gap of the um, is, is, is gapped so that the valence band of the gamete is actually higher than the conduction band, you get this direct phase. And when it's a band gap, as shown here by strain, you can get a topological, topological 3D insulator. So using this, um, this concept, uh, George carried out the K.P theory calculation Use and very it treated the um, alpha tin layer as a thin layer, which is quantum confined by the vacuum on one side and by the substrate on the, on the back side of the material. 
and using quantum confinement arguments, you can show that you can lift the um, band gap as the thickness of the material is varied, and there's a critical thickness depending upon the strain, which above which the material can go from a, a Dirac semi metal to a 3D topological insulator. This is a fine primarily as shown by this, um, for instance, in this plot of the uh, energy band, band structure, the primary band, structure, band gap material energies as you go from, as a function of film thickness. And you can see as you go to large thicknesses, you have a typical effort where you have a topological surface state, which is well below the gamma eight, gamma eight conduction band. At these thicknesses here, there's an overlap, this region where there's a crossing of the, um, of the, where the, 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 the bands overlap and you can, you have a Dirac semimetal for thicknesses, Dirac semimetal for thicknesses that are greater than around 400 angstroms in the case of um, 111 strained alpha tin. As you go to smaller thicknesses, you can see that the, the, um, the, this material, which is the conduction band, starts to lift away from that um, and cross, un, un, uninvert the band gap crossing and you transition to a 3D topological insulator due to the confine, quantum confinement effects. Um, self, this graph shows several interesting regions, which are, as you go to thin, you can get other topological phase changes in this region where it's somewhat complicated because all the, the heavy hole bands are, play a role, but you can actually go to a 2D topological insulator and then a trivial 2D material if you go to smaller thicknesses. I'll explain more in this region as we go further. But the important thing to point out is that at some point you go from a 3D topological insulator when you have these band hybridizations. These two plots are the, the symmetric and anti-symmetric hybridizations of a topological surface state. When it starts to gap, you essentially lose your three-dimensional topological insulator characteristics and the material becomes more like a, a 3D or 3D top, 3D trivial material or top, 2D topological insulator or quasi 3D trivial material. And as you go to smaller thicknesses, you get a 2D insulator and et cetera, 2D tri trivial insulator at some point. Now, the anisotropy in alpha tin is quite dependent, the orientation dependence of the uh, material, which uh, has, it allows it to vary the critical thicknesses quite a bit. So in the case of cattail, the critical thickness where you go is transition is about 470 angstroms in one one material where versus about 380 angstroms in 001 orientation. And these graphs show some typical plots of the overlap as you go from, as a function of thickness and strain. I'd like to emphasize in this plot here that we can actually go at very thin layers, you can actually go complete on removal of the band structure inversion. And you can go from a, a 2D topological insulator to a trivial 2D material if you go to very thin thicknesses. The only problem is experimentally realizing or seeing this transition is very difficult because you have to move your Fermi level between these heavy old bands, which makes it very difficult to realize experimentally in, me in um, transport measurements, for instance. So the next slide shows um, some more details in this region. And I I'll just emphasize that um, um, in, in this material, you can see more details as you go from from a trivial for 2D tri trivial to a topological insulator transition. A little more detail is shown there. The next slide shows, in essence, um, the same thing, except that I point out here that you go from a 2D insulator below this very thickness. So there's this critical thickness at which all topological materials characteristics vanish. You go, go to the final inversion, you uninvert the final bands, and you end up with a 2D insulator as you go to very thickness. This is for the case of uh, cadmium telluride substrates with a thickness of the order of um, 25 angstroms or so. So now this slides, um, this is some more theory that was done by George. Um, shown here are theory simulations of, um, of RPS measurements. In other words, angular photoelectron that data that can be simulated by theory when we're done. These are typical measurements that one used to see the band dispersion on these materials at the surface of these materials. Uh, George's theory is that you're able to use the Green's function um, technique to simulate RPS measurements of alpha tin. And shown here are uh, some interesting slides which where he uses the fact that um, you can actually see, you can decouple 
the heavy old structure, heavy old band. So it makes it, it makes it simple to avoid seeing the, the band hybridizations in the heavy old band, which complicates and makes it hard to see, interpret RPS measurements. But basically you can see there's a whole bunch of um, band de structure details that uh, especially heavy old details in the valence band, which tends to, to uh, make it hard to see the transition of a direct point or the crossing uh, out of identified direct point. Um, but basically, the, the key point is that you can see, you can use theory to simulate these RPS measurements. You can actually see the spin polarized surface states at, uh, and the direct point more clearly if you turn off the heavy old details. But nevertheless, you can see that the, uh, at this thickness, which is around 200 angstroms on a cattail substrate, you can see that you have a direct crossing and the, the rack cone is formed quite clearly if you take off, if you just remove the heavy old coupling for a while. If you put it in, you can see it's hard to discern, but it's still there. It's, it's actually degenerate with, the band, with heavy old band structure, the, the gamma eight heavy old band structure. So it's hard to see in a typical measurement, but all these um, details are related primarily to the heavy old band structure. If alpha tin is grown at enum timinite, because there's some positing aspects which I should point out, which which um, we found George found primarily, the the experimental reports of alpha tin at enum timinite is somewhat different critical thickness show somewhat different critical thicknesses for TD for 2D uh, materials from anyway from 2D TI to down to uh, and direct semimetal transitions. Surprisingly, though, alpha tin on enum timinite shows gapless topological surface states below. The expected critical thickness, and this is on your deck, and I'll discuss that in more detail later on. But but using um, various models, including a type type uh, type binding slab model, is able to calculate these these um, on infinite in the substrates. You can um, calculate these phases below. The primary difference here is that because the in the substrate, because of its band offset, it's very small, uh, and uh, on the order of maybe 0.1 eV or less, and it has a small band gap. The, the techniques are a little bit to calculate these details are a little bit different from the cattail material. But basically, experimental leaches are shown in these two plots where previous authors have shown the evidence of, of um, a three dimensional, a quasi three dimensional topical insulator at very thin layers on the order of maybe 24, 16 angstroms. And that by the time you go to 84 angstroms thick, it looks quite different. And basically, we think this is, they're seeing what evidence here looks like a, a 2D. Uh, the rack of metal and going to become like cause a quasi 3D top of insulator by the time you get to sorry the, uh, the rack of metal as you go to thicker layers and more like a 3D top of insulator as very thin layers at 60 angstroms and this is quite puzzling because typically band hybridization between the top and top and bottom top of the surfaces would actually wipe out this um, evidence of this uh, co uh, direct cone in typical materials but this is quite puzzling why does this happen and um, so George's theory shows that you can see these phases quite nicely, going from a 3D topical insulator all the way down to a 3D direct semi metal. Okay, so this slide is somewhat complicated, so I won't go into the details. But basically, uh, the main thing to point out is that due to quantum confinement, Cattell has a large band gap. One six one and a one point one a one point one eV band offset with alpha tin, so you can actually model it as a vacuum quantum well con confined thick layer. However, in the intermediate, it has a very small band gap, point two eV, and a very small alpha uh, or band offset with alpha tin. So because of that, George can show using a theoretical um, some theory that basically the quantum confinement is modeled is modified by strong asymmetry of the thin film, uh, confinement of the thin film. This makes it. And one can show, in essence, that the critical thicknesses are affected by the fact that you don't get a uh, formation of top level surface state at the bottom surface of the material. And this is expressed by this theorem that typically the, the, the critical thicknesses are smaller than what you'd expect if you uh, assume a vacuum approximation for the material. And um, this is a little clearer if one points to the next slide. You can, the critical thickness typically for cattail is on the order of, say, 24 angstroms. That's when you uninvert the bands finally, and you go from a 2D topological insulator to a 2D trivial insulator. 
And uh, but, so this critical thickness is on the order of say 24 angstroms for cattail materials, but for indium timinide, it's on the order of 12 angstroms. That explains why people have seen, uh, in essence, a 3D top of insulator at very thin layers of, of indium timinide on the order of say 12 angstroms, which is um, can be attributed to the fact that the band offset is so small and the band gap of indium timinide is quite quite small. Here is shown some RP simulations of a data which shows this point um, that uh, you actually can see from this material that you still get, in a sense, uh, you get um, minimal um, band gap in hybridization between for a very thin layer of indium timinide. And these slides just show further RP simulation data using a compare, comparison of cattail substrate and indium timinide substrates and the differences that one can see from the expected ARPIS data. These again, remember ARPIS theoretical simulations of ARPIS data that can be expected. Shown here is a 15 monolayer plot of alpha tin and indium timinide and using a 0 0.1 EV, assuming a 0.1 EV band, valence band offset. You can see still, even at this thickness, you still get, you get um, some distortion, but nevertheless, um, with or without turning off the heavy old states, you can see still that you get a formation of Dirac cone at this thickness quite nicely in the Iman timonite. Whereas in the cattail, which is shown to the right, you already get to see quite a bit of hybridization at the at this thickness in the top of the surface states. So they already open a gap in the uh, at four to five um, angstrom thickness. They already are, uh, which is 50 more layers roughly. You already open quite a bit of gaps. So the so the so the 3D top of insulator start stays hybridizes quite a bit in cattail versus in indium timinide. And whether you choose the band offset as being zero, doesn't make much difference. It makes a slight difference, but not essential. It doesn't destroy the fact that you can still observe um, a nice direct cone formation at these thin layers if you use an indium timinide substrate. If you go to thicker layers on the order of say uh, 25 mono layers, it, it, the picture starts to change. In, in alpha tin and indium timinide, you get quite a bit of, um, of distortion due to the fact that your approaching thickness is now becoming a Dirac semi metal as opposed to a 3D TR. So there's quite a bit of, um, of um, distortion here. Whereas in, in alpha tin, you're, you're getting to be a weak, a small gap, but it's still a 3D TR in this material. So alpha and aluminum timinide, you expect to see a transition to a direct metal at fairly uh, thicknesses under order of say 80 to 80 angstroms, whereas in alpha tin, it's quite the opposite. And, and cattail, it's quite the opposite. You still see basically a band gap opened, but still pretty much close to being a 3D TI at that point, or a 3D TI that's about to transition to um, a 2D, um, a 3D, um, trivial insulator. So the, the, the theoretical records allowed us to say that you can see a 2D Dirac metal phase quite easily can be achieved in a 001 orientation. Um, however, if you go to different orientations, assuming you could do the office measurements or do on the 100 or 010 surfaces, you can see alpha tin that's grown on cattail or anything like or indium and timonite behaves as a 3D top of the insulator, as shown by these uh, RPS simulation plots. So the interesting thing is that the, the rack summer metal, if you project to different surfaces, it has different behavior. And whether it is a, a, a whether you can see the RPS clearly or not, or a 3D TI behave. So it's somewhat dependent upon the, the direction of the, of the surface state that you're looking at, depending upon the, the material going. So that's interesting, but this is experimental, very difficult to realize. Uh, that is doing opposite in a one zero zero direction if the material is growing in a zero zero one orientation typically you can actually um you can actually do simulations using this technique looking at materials that has a large large lattice constant and so you went we already showed that george showed that basically alpha tin layers growing on on a lattice constant that have tensile tensile in in plane strain as opposed to compressive inside, you can actually see a very nice formation of a, a 3D TI material. And, and that can be quantum confined 
and you can open it, you can use that to see large band gap materials such as 50 MeV at 0.5% um, tensile strain um, using a thickness of 50 monolayers. And if you go down to quantum confine it with 10 monolayers, you can open up a very, fairly large band gap, this indirect band gap nevertheless, this material. And so, so this is quite interesting. Experimentally, we're going to try to see if we can realize this, this issue. This is a theoretical prediction from this, uh, this work. So you can go from um, seeing uh, the uh, the and metal to large confinement with double insulators just by using quantum confinement. And if you can grow tensile strained um, in plane strain material, alpha 10. So this can be done. There's some techniques that can be used to address this, but we'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. So here we, I mentioned some, some experimental work that was started on alpha tin and inulin timonide substrates early in the year, back in actually late last year. And we looked at um, trying to observe the 3D TI transition from a Diraxima metal to a 3D TI on this material, alpha tin grown at inulin timonide substrate. This was work that was done at UC, UCSB. And uh, we were basically trying to observe this transition here. Actually, this one here. And this is actually for one on one material, but we can also see that the, the transition is a little bit different for one zero zero orientation. So these are some of the results that were seen by ARPIS measurements that were done. The material is grown at, at UCSB and then put in a vacuum suitcase and taken up to LC to do um, ARPIS measurements. And we can see this is a material that was 51 million model uh, layers uh, thick. We can see ARPIS data that shows the band dispersion that shows basically this is below the, the rock point, of course, but we can see evidence of some band, some um, gamma A band data that shows up here on the sides. But basically, we see uh, the, the low half of the of a Dirac cone, which is shown up here. It's not that great, but it shows that we're seeing some evidence of the rock cone formation, in every, and all, as well as evidence, all these complicated band hybridizations with the gamma A band shows up in this, um, this, um, this data. If you go to um, lower energy, you can look at the top of the cone, you can see it a little better. Actually, the formation of, it's getting closer where the direct point is, but we didn't have enough, um, uh, well, we need to dope the material to see this more clearly. And this is just showing data along a different direction, using the same thickness, you see the same thing, basically. If we go to a smaller thickness, this is interesting. We see evidence that uh, this is actually um, 50 angstrom thick. We see evidence that we, the rack cone is still quite evident, or at least close to it anyway. We don't see the evidence of the, the band hybridization because it's further, it's slightly above the gamma eight band states. So we don't see those tails due to the, to the heavy old states. We weren't able to do any further um, measurements because of COVID related issues. So we stopped, both labs are shut down. So we haven't done anything on that since then. We hope to get back to that study um, later on. But what the hope is that we can, um, we can look at samples that are even thinner, maybe down to, to uh, 10 angstroms or so to see clear evidence of the rock point formation. And then also look at samples that are on the order of uh, say, uh, maybe, maybe um, 70 to 80 angstrom where we expect to see a transition to a direct semi-metal in this material. By the time you get to thicknesses that are above, say about 80 angstroms, it's already a direct semi-metal. And we expect to see that transition also in these studies. So um, that pretty much does most of the data. In this rest of this talk, I'll talk about some experimental studies that were done on samples alpha tin samples that were going in cattail. These are transport measurements that were done. And here I show some slides that we, of the material grown. We use, use various techniques to characterize the material as grown by MB in our lab at ERA. And this is, um, these samples were grown at ERA actually, but on cattail substrates. But, but you know, using read and some X-ray diffraction and so on, Raman scattering, we can identify when we have alpha tin quite nicely. The Raman peak is actually quite definitive and it allows us to tell at this energy that we have alpha 10 as opposed to beta 10, which is, doesn't show any from on signal at all. And this is a photograph, although on a large scale of the surface, it looks like it's reasonably decent material. Although 
the rough features are hidden by the underscale, so you can see it, but it's reasonably good material. We can do fabrication of hall bar devices. Um, it's not easy, but it can be done, and we can go on and do transport measurements, which was done in this sample. Here are some transport measurements that were done as we measure, for instance, resistance as a function of temperature. Uh, and um, the data shows, interestingly, some behavior which is metallic, like at low temperatures. And, um, and we even saw some small quantum oscillations at high field in this material. This material is grown in a thickness range at around, say, I think it's 480 angstroms, which is in the Dirac semi-metal regime. So we believe this is evidence, some transport evidence of direct semi-metal behavior in this material. The quality was not as good as we'd like. Carrot densities are much higher than we would like in this material, but um, and the mobilities are not as great as, you know, around 4,000 centimeters squared per volt second. So they, that's why you see the quantum oscillations is not very pronounced. But nevertheless, it's, we, we hope to do more studies in this material range where we're looking at the direct semi-metal quality transport characteristics. Nevertheless, the data shows that we, it looks like we're having a direct metal at this thickness. And we hope to continue these studies. Yeah. Okay, so in conclusion then, I wanted to point out, this slide is somewhat expansive. I won't go into all the details. But the main point is that um, theoretical formation is, has been done. Formalism is done by our theorists to look at um, using primary Green's function code. You can simulate office of alpha 10. And actually, other other um, observables can be can be obtained from from the means function model of the of this of this interface of this thick materials, and so demonstrate that we can see three D and two D direct metal phase in alpha tin, and as a function of thickness, quantum confinement converts this direct metal phase to three um, D topological insulator, and then a two D top and possibly even a two D um, trivial insulator if one can access it experimentally using gates to fair and firmer level, for instance. But nevertheless, this is an interesting thing. We can see the theory predicts that we should be able to observe a number of um, topological phase changes in these materials just by varying primarily the, the, the thickness and using strain uh, as, a, as, a, as another parameter. Um, we hope to, to go to um, tin size strain material using tin geranium. And um, this should be quite interesting set of experiments to do. We can grow maybe 5% um, germanium tin. At that thickness, the, um, it should be, this should be in, in, in plane tensile strain, which will produce a compressive unit axle strain that's needed. Open up a band gap. And, and it should be a, a strong top of insulator using this material. Um, at, at, at a variety of thicknesses, actually, quite, quite, we can vary the thickness quite a bit, but. It should be easier to observe band gap opening in this material using germanium dope tin. Um, other predictions we mentioned already, so I won't uh, delay. This is primarily conclusion that the theory has been done. We're hoping to do more experimental work to verify these stuff like phase changes in this material. This makes it, this material quite um, interesting um, because for applications, we're looking at potential spintronics and other topological electronic devices applications at the Arm Research Lab. Okay, thank you very much for your time and your patience in waiting for the talk. I hope I didn't rush through it too much, but thanks a lot. Okay. So if members of the audience have questions, you can, uh, I guess you can just use the chat mechanism at the bottom of your slide and submit them to Dr. Folks, and you can answer and address them in real time. So any questions or comments? Well, Patrick, I have one question. Um, what's known about the structure of lead? Is there a concomitant alpha phase and or have this as a okay. um, Let me see. I um no, I don't, don't recall any any um let me think for a minute. I don't recall any any analysis or or um 
or use of lead on an alpha tin. I, I only think of we thought about possibly looking at um, lead growing, depositing lead on alpha tin. Lead is a superconductor at around what is it, seven, uh, 7K or 8K. So one possibility was to try to look at proximity induced right. superconductivity right. in using lead. Um, we haven't um, done those sort of experiments yet. That's something that we think we might try at some point, but we haven't gotten around to doing it. But as far as I would say that's pri primary application or influence of lead. As a dopant, I don't think anybody has used it or as a, material, as a way to to change any of the topological characteristics of alpha tin, I don't think so. But primarily as a proximity induced metal or material to use to get proximity effects. Okay. Uh, magnetic also We're looking at magnetic materials effects, proximity induced magnetic materials. But lead is primarily as a superconductor will be interesting for that purpose. Can you see on your chat line, Patrick? You do have a question for Pati from Patiba Dev at Howard University. If you can't see it, I can read it for you. I, I can't see it, Steve. <laughs> okay, so can you elaborate on the mechanism that changes the critical thickness? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Pratiba, you're Go ahead. there. I'm sorry. Okay, so the question is uh, from Pratiba Dev at Howard University. Can you elaborate on the mechanism that changes the critical thickness in the presence of the substrate? Say, for example, uh, indium antimonide. Yeah, so the mechanism is primarily the effect that um, the, the quantum confinement is, is asymmetric. And um, on one side, it's, it's strongly confined by, in effect, the, the vacuum, uh, which is the, the upper, upper interface of the alpha T material, what it sees. And then on the other side, on the substrate side, the confinement is very, very poor. So um, it, it's almost like it's, it's almost no band, no band offset. It's either 0.1 EV or perhaps even zero EV. We, that's a measurement we hope to do. We tried it, but it didn't work the first time, so we're going to go back to it. But it, we know it's very small. So in coupled to that with the fact that you have a very thin, uh, a very thin, let me go back to this, very thin, um, I mean, very small band gap in indium timonide, those two effects um, combine to give you a very, a very weak, um, actually almost no uh, topological surface state on the on the side that faces the inner material substrate. So there's very little hybridization going on between the between the low substrate side surface and the upper surface. Typically, most materials have strong hybridization as you as soon as you narrow, make the material thin enough. So in cattail, you have a very strong hybridization going on between the two the top and the bottom topological surface states. And in inner material, there's almost no hybridization going on, or very very small. And that combines to make this um, this critical thickness small, uh, as shown here. Now, there's a theory which I, I don't um, quite, which George DeCosta came up with, which, which shows nicely. I don't fully understand this, so I won't go into the details here. I think George understands this best. But basically, he, show, he can show that the um, those two effects combine to give a very, very, um, to make the critical thickness more than what you'd expect if you confine the material with, in a vacuum model, for instance, vacuum on both sides. And so that effect, I think it's primarily in this, the quantum confinement is strong, is modified by strong asymmetry of the thin film. That makes it, the quantum confinement weaker. And so, so the, the bands tend to move very slowly as you vary the thickness because of that effect. Due to the quantum confinement, the bands don't move as much as one would like, I say in cattail. So that makes it a much weaker quantum confinement effect and makes the critical thicknesses much smaller than um, big primarily because you don't get hybridization going on between the front surface and the back surface topological surface states. So the lack of that hybridization means that you can go to much thinner films and still see topological you know, effects, insulator effects. Okay. So Patrick, you have another question from Christina McGain. She asks, you, have may, you may have mentioned this, but have you considered using flexible or sketchy substrates to test the possible effects of strain on the phase transitions of, in alpha tin? A good question. However, um, we have thought about that. It's just experimentally very difficult to realize. Alpha tin is actually quite, um, 
but that's what's the word. It's quite tricky to grow or to deposit on most materials. It doesn't like too much variation from its um, band, from its lattice constant. Which substrates that have a, a, a lattice constant that's much different from its own. And so that's why most people who have grown MB alpha tin only grow it on two substrates primarily, the indium and timonite and cattail. So um, because of the difficulty in getting clean enough interfaces and, and more importantly, um, any lack of any strain parameters, strained um, surface morphologies that would strain points that would cause disruption of alpha tin growth, um, it's hard to realize experiments with those kind of interfaces. Alpha tin actually prefers to grow in the beta, beta tin, uh, you know, it, as tin prefers to grow, I should say, as a beta tin material, more, you know, morphology, and because of the thermodynamics involved in the growth. And so it's, it's fairly easy. Anything that disrupts the, the surface, you know, whether it be strain points or impurities or things like that will cause material to grow as beta tin rather than alpha tin. It's not so, so easy to go out for the research, basically. So Patrick, Christina has a follow-up question. So she asks, sure. so alpha tin does not like to get transferred to other substrates after the fact, after the fact either. Right, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, unless you can lock down your substrate uh, and then it's very stable on certain substrates. And, and the substrates that we know it's stable on are, are the indium timonide and the cattail substrates. You can make those substrates thin, but to actually remove it and then put it onto a different substrate is um, somewhat problematic, I would say. Okay. So Christina responds, she likes your, your answer. That makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions or comments from the audience? So if not, I guess we can uh, conclude the seminar and thank the speaker. And again, uh, our, our apologies for this, the uh, technical problems in the beginning, but we got up to speed and everything worked out well. Yeah. Thank the audience for the patience. I, I think the technical difficulties are primarily because I'm a novice user of Zoom. So <laughs> we don't use Zoom at our lab. We use another one, MS Teams. And so I'm more familiar with MS Teams, but yeah, so that's probably the primary reason but yeah. yeah, I thank the audience for the opportunity. Thank you, Stephen. Sure. And no, um, no problem. We're all learning in this new universe. So, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to give this talk. I, it was uh, definitely a honor to do this. So, and again, I thank the audience for your patience. I really um, I apologize for the mishaps, but thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. All right, Stephen. So um, I'll talk to you sometime. I send an email. Yes, but we'll basically... talk off. We'll talk offline. Right. All right. Okay. Take care and thanks a lot. Thank okay, you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye.